I'm I'm concerned. I'm really concerned on that front. The vacancy rate is exceptionally low. You know, unless there's a significant change on that front, I think the population growth is actually going to still further outstrip the supply of new units. Welcome to the Tom Story Show with Steve Karish and Tom Story, where we discuss everything real estate or whatever else is on our minds. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Tom Story Show. Uh, Steve, this is a very, very special episode uh, because of our guest, who who I will introduce in one moment. But We also made it to number 100. We did it. Uh, Every single Sunday for 100 episodes, we've done it. We've had a few bonus ones thrown in there. But uh, so thank you for being here in the first 100 if you've been here since day one. Or if you're brand new today, welcome. And hopefully you'll stick around for the next 100. But uh, it happened, Steve. We finally made it. How do you feel? Feels great. I think this is great. And we got probably our best guests uh, ever. I don't know. Well, let's say to date. Hopefully we're going to keep even getting better. But uh, <laughs> we got we got somebody legit today. So I'm super excited. So if you're watching us on YouTube, I just want to say thank you. Make sure to like this video if you learn anything new today and subscribe to our channel. If you're listening on the audio platforms, I hope you're having a wonderful day. For episode 100, we've got Doug Porter. Doug is the chief economist at BMO Financial Group. And Doug, I see a lot of people playing what we call fake economists on the internet. A lot of them play it on Twitter. You're one of the real ones, and I know our audience is going to love kind of your understanding of what's going on. And we're going to pepper you with questions today about the economy, housing. So thank you so much for being here. Well, thanks for having me and congratulations on number 100. I'm I'm honored. Yeah. Well, we're we're happy that you're here. So, I want to start with I want to get a bit of the background on you for what you do on a day to day. Uh being the chief economist at one of the big five banks in Canada is obviously a very very sought after position. For you, just the last 5 years of pandemic, rates dropping, rates going up like is this been the craziest 5 years of your career? It is definitely right up there. Uh, I, I would have to say yes. Um, there, there have been all you know a lot of very dramatic episodes, and in, in the I, I, and I've been working on Bay Street, um, not not to date myself too much, uh, for almost forty years now. I got recruited right out of elementary school by uh, by the Bank of Montreal back in nineteen eighty four. Uh, so I've you know I've seen a lot of really <laughs> traumatic times. Um, you know I have to I have to say the the global financial crisis in 08, 09 was was pretty wicked. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I would say for for outright drama and when you include in some of the political stuff in the last few years and you know the war in Ukraine and of course the pandemic, yeah, I think this 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 would probably rank up there as the most volatile of of my career. And I feel like I have to ask this just because again they got you out of elementary school. But in 1989, living in I don't know if you were in Toronto then, but seeing what we saw with the housing market then, and then obviously 2008, we've had these moments in time where these big things happen. Is there any similarities or differences that you can point back to? Like, okay, inflation in the late 80s, obviously the housing crisis in 2008 from the states was a little bit different. But how would you draw from what you've seen before? So I would say every cycle has its own unique characteristics. You know, the old uh, Mark Twain saying history doesn't repeat, it rhymes. The, you know, there certainly are some rhythms that we've seen before, but, you know, this is not exactly like the inflation episode we saw in the 70s. It's not exactly like the housing bubble that, while well, I lived through in Toronto in the in the late 80s and the crash in the early 90s, it's not exactly like the the tech bubble in the late 1990s, but it's got a little bit of elements of all three of those things and we can we can definitely learn from the past but it it's unlikely that things will ever repeat exactly as as we've seen before and certainly this this one is a little bit different from each one of those three episodes it's but but it, but it does have elements of of past cycles for sure one of the things that i know a lot of our viewers or people that are watching this uh, want to get an understanding on is like when is the right time and i know that you look at more than just the housing mark but what, when is the right time to get in and it seems like so far, and, and this could be too early, right, that the, the landing hasn't been as hard as some people thought. It seems like inflation's looking okay these days. I just want to get your understanding on like, are we out of the woods? Are we just kind of creeping our way back in? Like, how are you feeling just about overall what the numbers are saying? So overall, I have to say I'm, I'm actually much more positive or in, encouraged than I would have been a year ago. Okay. Um, I must admit, you know, full disclosure, uh, back early in 2023, late 22, 
we were pretty convinced that the the Canadian economy was going to go through at least a mild downturn, yeah. um, if if not even a, a fairly serious recession. Uh, we thought that you know with the inflation you know hitting eight percent at one point in twenty two and and the amount that the Bank of Canada was raising interest rates, and given the level of household debt in in the country, there was almost no way we were going to get through this episode with it, without at least a mild downturn. And you know just to start off on a positive note, I think the you know the really solid thing that's happened is we've had inflation go from eight nine percent down to about three percent and a little bit lower now in in Canada without going through a, an outright downturn and and it does look like the bank and and the Federal Reserve are done raising interest rates and you know now it's really a question of when they start coming down uh, so it, it does look like we have managed to avoid the worst for sure are we completely out of the woods on the economic front no I don't think we are mm. just yet uh, I I you know, I think if we get through the next six months, uh, we, we will be in the clear. Um, but we haven't quite got inflation down to where the central banks like to target it. And it's, you know, it, it has been a challenge for the Canadian economy. Look, yeah. it's it's done better than we expected. But the growth we've seen over the past year has been pretty minimal. And especially when you stack it up against the kind of population growth we've seen, you know, a lot of people have made this point that if you look at it on a per person basis, we actually have gone into reverse in the, in the last year. So while it's not officially a recession, it's, right. it's felt pretty tough for a lot of people. There's, n- there's no two ways about it, but, uh, still, I, I, I do think we, it, it looks as if we've avoided the worst. Certainly, uh, the U S has done a lot better than I think anybody could have believed. And that's, that's actually part of the reason why Canada has managed to, to just get through this without an, an outright downturn. So over, overall, yeah, I'd say I'm a little bit more positive than I would have been a year ago. Because how the bank of th- we oh, sorry, avoided Steve, that. How do you think we avoided yeah. that? That's the crazy part. Like everyone is expecting this kind of uh, doom and gloom couple of years here. And it so far, I mean, I don't know if you looked at the S&P lately, but it's on fire, right? Like how, I, I, obviously a lot of that's the States. Uh, I just got back from Disneyland. Trust me, their economy seems to be doing just fine. <laughs> yes. But like, how does that, all how did we avoid that in canada when we all feel like we should be in a much worse position so bigger picture and and you know it's interesting that you uh, mentioned disney because i think in in an, in a nutshell that that that's basically the story is that the us consumer really held in there so coming into the last year we we were faced with two forces we hadn't really seen before one positive one negative and frankly we weren't sure which one was going to win out on, on the one side, we we had this ferocious rise in interest rates, you know, the likes of which we'd, we'd really not seen since the 1970s in terms of just how quickly the Fed and the Bank of Canada raised interest rates. So that was the negative. On the positive side, though, we were coming out of the pandemic. American and Canadian consumers were sitting on a lot of savings, a lot of savings. And of course, you know, many, many of us had not traveled for two years. Uh, there was a lot of pent up demand for for entertainment, for travel. I don't want to give all the credit to Taylor Swift, but, you know, I think that's sort of symbolic <laughs> of how people were willing to, yeah. you know, just spend on experiences. And frankly, the excess savings, the so-called excess savings and that pent up demand won the day that over that overcame interest rates. Definitely in the U.S., I think even to a small extent in Canada, Canadians were sitting on a lot of excess savings, too. We had a lot more debt than our American counterparts, but it did look like we consumer spending did manage to do a bit better than we expected. The other secondary point, by the way, this is a bit a bit more nerdy, um, but the other the other thing that really kept the U.S. economy afloat is is Washington spent a lot more money. Um, you know, basically their budget deficit grew in the in the last year or two, which personally I think was was not the correct policy. Um, but you know, and and they've left themselves with a huge budget deficit. But the the, the plus side is it kept the economy rolling for uh, you know much stronger than than many expected, and and some of that filtered filtered over in the, into Canada. The strong U.S. growth definitely helped our export industries. Uh, you know, auto production has actually been going up solidly, which is unusual in a downturn. Again, that goes to the the pent up demand story. So it's it's been a very bizarre cycle. But I, I would have to attribute most of it to the U.S. consumer and to a lesser extent the Canadian consumer, and you know, just all the excess savings and and pent up demand they had. It it overcame that rise in interest rates. And Doug, everyone has their opinion on the Bank of Canada. What we've seen it, we see it in our comment section. We know what's going on, and we all also understand that they have one tool in their toolbox, and they've been using it. And some people felt like they went too far, and they, or maybe they didn't start going up as soon as they should have. Looking at everything now, at where inflation's at, do we have to give them a level of credit and say, "Hey, what you're doing is actually working here"? Like, do we feel like they did what they needed to do? 
uh, with without delving into hero worship, I I, I think that we we are on the cusp of them, you know, re- really pulling off something quite well here. If you know, if we really do get through this without an outright recession, I th- I think they've done a great job, and and I w- I would give uh, the, the the Fed some some credit as well. I, and and make no mistake, they both of them waited too long to start raising interest rates. I think the Bank of Canada got it before a lot of other central banks did. But they, you know, they are somewhat boxed in by the Canadian dollar. If they start raising rates, yeah. you know, a lot more aggressively than others, it's going to send the Canadian dollars skyrocketing. So they, they had to be sort of careful and cautious in terms of raising rates. But to me, they they were warning earlier than others. They, you know, for instance, they stopped a so-called quantitative easing earlier than others. They were one of the first to start raising rates and they were one of the more aggressive early on. Ideally, all central banks would have started raising rates a little bit earlier. So we did wouldn't have had quite the inflation episode that we ended up with and rates wouldn't have had to go as high as they end up going. But it does look at this point like they've struck almost the right balance. I, you know, I, I can't say that they raise rates too much because we haven't actually seen the economy uh, get tilt into a downturn. And, and yet inflation has started to, you know, come down pretty meaningfully. So it, it looks at this point that they've just got the balance right. And, and we can only hope that that, you know, I, I feel like I'm I'm talking to a pitcher in the seventh inning who's got a a no hitter going. You know, that like uh, you, know, right. you know, it's almost it's almost like we can jinx it or something. But it, but at this point, it actually does look pretty encouraging that they they have struck just the right balance. It's like a it's like a goalie with a sh- and you don't want to say the word shutout in the third period, Same. right? You don't want to jinx anything, right? Yeah. Same idea. So with, with the most recent announcement uh, by the Bank of Canada, Tiff Macklem uh, actually came out and. <laughs> I feel like they try to avoid the housing talk in a lot of those announcements, but that's what our audience really cares about. And in his last uh, press conference, he actually said that, yeah, house prices could rebound uh, very quickly, quickly or maybe unexpectedly. And that is a big upside risk here if they do start pulling back the interest rates. So because kind of famously, uh, lately, a lot of economists, well, maybe end of last year, were thinking that April, May might be the time. Now they're kind of saying June might be the time when when rates start to come back. Where do you see by the end of this year, or maybe going into next year, where do you think the overnight rate is going to be, if you had to guess? And we will hold you to it in the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no pressure. Um, and, and, you know, of course I have to make this call all the time, so it's nothing new for me. Um, yeah. So now we're getting down to brass tacks. So our, our official view for some time has been that the bank of Canada was going to start cutting in June and that they were going to cut rates by a hundred basis points this year. And then another hundred basis points next year. I would say the risk to that call from what I have seen and heard, uh, both, you know, in the, in the economic data and from the bank of Canada, the risk is that they wait even a little bit longer and they do a little bit less this year. I, I'm fairly comfortable saying that rates are going to be around 3% by the end of 2025, but how quickly we get there is is still very much open for debate. And it really does come down to what the inflation numbers tell us in, in the next six months or so. That's that's really the key here. Um, after all, that's that's what the, the Bank of Canada targets. They, they're an inflation targeting central bank. They have been since the early 1990s. They take that target really seriously. And that's that's really going to be their guidepost. And you know, I I mean, obviously, we have a forecast on what inflation is going to do. We've been one, I not to brag. Um, I think Go we've been it. one brag. of the better, I think we've been one of the better inflation forecasters uh, in the in the last three years or so. Uh, that just means we've been less wrong than others. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, we we can't say for sure where inflation is going. But uh, but but we do we we do think that the the bank is going to start cutting around mid year. There is a risk that they push it out into into the July meeting. That's certainly a, a risk. Some some are even saying September. Mm-hmm. I I wouldn't totally discard that. It certainly does sound like from Mr. Macklem's latest comments, it's highly unlikely he's going to cut at the April meeting, and so the next one after that is is June. So, I think that's the really the first realistic time that rates will start coming down. Uh, the other the other part of that question is you know how 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 much this year. I think 100 basis points might be a tad aggressive. Um, we're also looking for that from the Federal Reserve. I definitely think that's maybe a bit aggressive for uh, for the Fed. It, it, you know, the Fed uh, officially has the so-called dot plot where they tell you what they think rates are going to do, and the the latest dot plot said, 
they're going to cut rates by 75 basis points this year. I'm starting to believe that that's actually a pretty good call. Mm-hmm. Um, at, at, you know, and the Fed's not always right, by the way, in, the, in those dot plots. Uh, they're, they're, they're more for our interest and general guidance, um, but it's certainly not, uh, you know, they don't feel like they're committed to that. I, 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 that, by the way, that's where the financial markets are more or less leaning these days for both, both the bank and the Fed is, is about 75 basis points or three quarters of a percent in cuts this, uh, this year. And I'm, I'm starting to, to lean to, to viewing that's a bit more reasonable than our call of a hundred basis points. Doug, the, um, the 2% inflationary target, I was just, for our audience, could you break down for me? Like I've done some research on this and tried to figure it out and I've had different opinions on this. Is 2% just the magic number and that's never going to change? Could it be three? Could it be one and a half? Like, could something change one day where all of you get in the room and go, this is the new number? Why has it been at two for so long? Hey agents, a clean and easy to manage real estate website is a must. Go to realtyninja.com slash Tom right now and start your site totally for free and pay nothing until you launch. And then when it is your time to go live, you will save 20% off of your entire first year just for signing up at realtyninja.com slash Tom. Yeah, and, and to tell you the truth, it was kind of arbitrarily chosen back in the early 1990s. Um, the, the, actually, the Central Bank of New Zealand, of all places, was actually the, the first one to start inflation targeting, and uh, the Bank of Canada was soon after them, back, uh, as I said, back in the early 90s. And initially, the bank had picked 3% with an aim of slowly ratcheting down, that down to 2 Just as a bit of historical context, the GST had just gone up, and, uh, you know, inflation actually got above 5% for a while. So they didn't want to immediately grind it down to 2%. So they sort of set a, 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 a target by the mid-90s of getting to 2 and And it's been there ever since, since the mid-1990s. Every five years, the central bank gets together with the federal government okay. and says, you know, is this still reasonable? Is this still what we want to uh, to aim for? And the last time they, uh, they took a look at it was the end of 2021. Uh, they came to the view again that 2% was a reasonable target. Uh, they'll have to review that again in uh, in 26. I, I actually, to answer the other part of your question, is are we always going to be at 2%? Not necessarily. I actually do think there have been some serious questions whether 2% is is the right number. Is there anything magical mm-hmm. about 2%? And the, the answer is no. Um, it could be a bit higher. I actually think that that's not an unreasonable uh, goal to aim for is you know somewhat higher inflation like like three percent would not be an unreasonable goal. The issue is changing that target when you're in the middle of the fight. You know it's like changing yeah. the, you know changing the size of the goal in mm-hmm. you know in the middle of a hockey game. Like you just can't change the rules in in the middle of of you know when when you're right in it. I would say a couple of years from now, assuming you know we get inflation back to two percent and we're there for a year or two, that might be a reasonable time to at least consider changes the target. We, we can't do it right now though. Um, because then no one will ever trust the central bank again, you know, like they, they, they won't believe the target in the future if, right. if we change it just because we're above it in, uh, you know, in the current circumstances. And even though inflation looks like it's been moving in the right direction for a period of time now, uh, a lot of the comments that we see is that people go, okay, yeah, inflation in January was 2.9%, but like 50 something percent of it was housing related costs. It was higher mortgage rates, it was higher rent, it was electricity, it was insurance, like we could go down the list. I'd love to know your perspective on that, where it's a necessary evil, we know we need to go up to get everything else down, but it seems to me like you're just taking the money that would have been out there spending on dinners or movies or whatever, and you're just moving it back into your house payment, but your house isn't getting any better. Does that argument make sense? But I guess that's that's just the reality of where we're at. Yeah, and by by the way, I'll tell you a full disclosure. This this is a serious debate among chief economists. I was actually just in a meeting the other day with all the other uh, chief economists with the uh, with the major uh, central banks or major banks, I should say. And uh, you know, there there's even disagreement among, among uh, the mm-hmm. chief economists in terms of how we should look at uh, shelter inflation, and you know, should the bank ignore it, or you know, should they completely take it on board? And I, I think the answer is somewhere in between. I, I, I'm more in the camp that I, I think they should take it seriously and they should not ignore shelter inflation. Um, you know, things like rent and property taxes, electricity, home insurance, that's real. Yeah. You know, they, they should not just, you know, take that and throw it out the window and ignore it. I don't, I don't agree with that at all. Um, you know, I think it actually is reflective of the fact that there are, there is a lot of serious inflation going on in, in areas other than mortgage costs and, 
and and home prices, um, you know, even in core expenditures that most of us face, it's it's real, and 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 that can affect inflation psychology. It it, it almost doesn't matter where the inflation is coming from now. If if we've got three percent or higher inflation, mm. pe- people are not going to care whether it's coming from your mortgage costs or from gasoline prices or from food prices. They're going to want to see a wage increase that offsets that, and they're going to believe that inflation is going to stay high if the headline number. Is 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 still printing above three percent. So and and I think that's what the Bank of Canada has been more or less telling us. It's like yes, we know shelter inflation is a big part of this, but it affects everyone's psychology, everyone's inflation psychology. So we can't we can't just take it out of the index and and pretend it's not there when it it really is driving a lot of the uh, the overall inflation numbers. The last thing I'll say on that topic is is by the way, I, th- I think everyone is acutely aware that if you take out just mortgage interest costs alone. Yeah. Yeah. Inflation is basically at two percent on the button, mm-hmm. right, uh, right, right now. So some people are saying, "Well, the job's done," you know. Right. Uh, you know, we why don't why don't we stop right there? The the trouble is there's there's actually a lot of other components that people don't talk about that have fallen a lot in the past year: childcare, telephone mm-hmm. charges, airfares, all down double digits in the in the past year. Some of those are not going to last forever. Childcare was kind of a one off change that they made. And you know, frankly, things like telephone charges and airfares. I don't. I don't know what airline statistics Canada's flying on. I don't <laughs> believe that airfares have fl- dropped by fourteen percent in the past year. Uh, you know, the Globe Mail pointed out that uh, the the reported decline in cell phone charges of fourteen percent. That's not really reality for a lot of people. So not for me. You know, yeah, same. So I, I actually do think that there are a lot of other components that are exaggerating or, or underestimating how uh, how strong inflation is. There, there is final, final yeah. comment. Sorry, I'm really dragging. No, no, keep going. Keep, keep talking. Going. They don't want to hear yeah. us. We want to hear you. <laughs> there, there is one measure of inflation that the Bank of Canada really does focus on. It's called the median inflation rate, and I, I think it's actually a really good measure. It just looks, look, if you got a hundred prices out there, you know, fifty are rising above the median, fifty are rising below the median. What is that middle good or service doing? Hmm. That's a really good measure of inflation, I think. And right now, it's three point three percent. Okay. It's it's come down. It's it's not bad. It's almost there, but it's got to it's got to come down just a little bit further. That and to me that's a pretty pure measure. I want to ask you more of a personal question just to go off topic for one second. So, me and Steve, we live and breathe real estate. This is what we do. We've both been doing it for long over a decade. Um, and when I get home, it's like the last thing I want to talk about. So I want to know the truth. When Doug gets into an Uber and they start chatting with you and they ask you what you do for a living, do you have a fake job title that you give them? You know, you've, you've just given me a great idea. I, <laughs> I, I really should because it, it is amazing how many cab or Uber rides I've been in where, you know, the whole half hour is spent talking about the uh-huh. you know, the price of Bitcoin or gold or real estate. Usually it's real estate yeah. or, you know, should I go variable or fixed? Um, yeah, I, I actually should come up like, I don't know, opera singer or something. I, I really do need a new career, I think. Uh, it, it, again, off topic, but Bitcoin's going on a bit of a rise right now. Yeah. Do you, do, I don't, I don't know nothing about that side of things. Is that something that you guys are actively tracking in your, in your reports and what you're doing every single day? We definitely track it. Um, it's it's interesting. We actually do not get that many questions anymore about it. Um, mm-hmm. It's, I mean, I, I I have my own opinion as to you know what what drives it back and forth. Um, I I personally am not interested in, in investing in Bitcoin. I think I think it is you know obviously it is a real financial asset that yeah. uh, does have its uses. Obviously, there are a lot of fans. I just don't know whether the appropriate value is a thousand dollars or a hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars. And you know, given the kind of uh, you know wild swings we've had in recent years. I think for most investors, it's just not something you, you know, you should really spend a lot of time uh, lo- looking at. With all of this, um, and you say, you know, you do hop into a cab and you end up talking uh, the economy and that usually ends up in Canada. It ends up in real estate. Given everything that we've just talked about, what do you think the next... 12 months, 24 months, maybe five years. What is your uh, outlook for the overall Canadian market? Is uh, is the end near for the mortgage renewal crisis or is that all just going to wash out uh, and we're going to have the soft landing like you kind of alluded to that we might be having at the beginning of the conversation? So I, the, the one 
I would say thing we got wrong in the last couple of years on the uh, on on the real estate market is we we actually thought it would have more of a correction than end up end up having given the scale of the interest rate hike that we saw. Uh, we were, we were looking for a, a peak to trough decline in national prices of closer to twenty five percent. It it never really fell as much as twenty percent from peak to trough. It, you know, we had the right idea, but uh, I I would say that you know the surprise to me is how resilient the market ended up being. And and of course we've had a a completely story, a different story across the country. It, you know, you've got Calgary, who I liken to Secretariat, you know, running away from the rest of the field. <laughs> um, their their prices have actually gone up since the bank of Canada started raising interest rates. Unbelievable. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, you've had much of southwestern Ontario that absolutely boomed during the pandemic has had a very serious correction, you know, close to that 25% dec- drop in, in price we were looking at. Toronto is somewhere in between. It's been a little bit weaker than the national average. It didn't quite boom like southwestern Ontario and parts of eastern Ontario. Uh, it's had a pretty serious correction, but it does look like it's starting to stabilize now. Then there are cities like Vancouver, Montreal, Halifax, and even Edmonton that, frankly, I will tell you, held up a lot better than I would have expected. They, they had a modest correction, but the kind of peak to trough declines we're talking about in prices were, you know, depending on the city, something like two to six percent that's that's trivial you know given the five own your five percentage point rise in in interest rates and to me that's the real surprise at how well those those kind of cities just held in there looking ahead um i don't think as as i said i don't think we're completely out of the woods uh we look the you know around the turn of the year um late last year early this year we saw a nice bounce in in sales in a lot of cities the February numbers that are, have started to roll in are a little bit more cautious. Um, certainly in Toronto, uh, we saw we saw sales pull back a bit. Listings really pick up, um, so the market's uh, balanced again, again. We think you know some people were talking about how the housing market was on fire after the the January numbers. Well, that that was a bit of an exaggeration. I mean, clearly, you know things were supported by the weirdly mild winter we we had, and and the hint that the Bank of Canada might start to cut interest rates. I, I think reality returned to the market in uh, in February. Our, so our view is that we're we're basically looking at a stalemate through this year. We think, you know, there 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 are all, there is pent up demand. No question about it. We got this, you know, force of very strong population growth, but I also think there's a lot of pent up sellers too who've been waiting for, you know, the market to to firm a bit. And and I think we sort of fight to a standstill this year. Where we don't see things deteriorate really, but we also don't see a a, a mark pickup. I, I I am constructive for 2025 though. I just think that the the very intense population growth we're seeing and the amount of pent up demand and and we'll probably look at a lower interest rate environment uh, by by 2025 probably means the market sees a more a uh, full um, rebound in uh, when you get out into 2025. The other part of your question in terms of whether we're past the worst on the, the mortgage base. So I, I've actually been of the view that, you know, and a, a lot of our competitors have been talking about, oh, you know, watch out for the mortgage cliff in 2025 or 26. I'm not so worried about 25 and 26. I'm worried about this year. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this is the year that rates are are still at their their peak. They're going to be there for a little bit while longer. We've se- we're seeing the unemployment rate gradually creep up. You know, we're, as I said, we're not completely out of the woods on the economic front. I actually think this this is really the, the the test case. This this is the year that we have to get through. By 25 and 26, incomes will have risen more, rates will be coming down, so people will have a little bit more, you know, different options that they they you know they can deal with at, at that time. I actually think it's 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 this year that's that's the real test. And we, and we have started to see consumer insolvencies and bankruptcies, you know, starting to creep up. I, I would say they they've really just normalized, but they're probably going to go a bit higher. In the next six months, so I I personally believe that this is the the test year, not twenty five twenty six. Is there any concern on the other side of things? So, like, if we get into twenty twenty five and the overnight rate by the end of this year is at four percent or four point two five, and then mid twenty twenty five it's at three point seven five or wherever it ends up potentially getting, like I can tell you, generally the Toronto market is not on fire. You're absolutely right. It is doing what it always does in a normal market heading into the spring. Like this is what happens every year that doesn't have a global pandemic or like 10 rate hikes, right? Like this is pretty normal for us. But saying all that, you know, for freehold housing, especially semi-attached homes and detached houses in in good pockets of the city, like the action's back. The prices aren't near peak, but the action is back. If we then go, okay, the action's already here now. If Bank of Canada does get more aggressive than we think at the end of this year and pull down rates, 
are we worried that the housing market's going to pick up again a little bit too fast? Or does Bank of Canada just say, we got inflation under control, we did our job, the market is the market? Yeah, and I will tell you, I, I am a bit worried that uh, we you know we could get the market flaring again. And, and it, you look, it could happen this year. Even it might not even be a 25 story. Right. We had a little bit of a taste of that around the turn of the year you know we did we did see activity bounce a bit you know just just to be clear even though we had sales bounce back they were still below a, you know a 10-year average they were they were not strong by any means but listings were fairly weak as well so the market looked you know re relatively tight um I, I i am concerned especially given you know how what rents have done what population growth has mm -hmm. done you know which which way could we really be surprised it's, yeah it's that the market comes flaring back quite quickly and the big kid is not blind to that you know, and, and Macklem even said it the other day that, you know, insofar as the housing market comes snapping back really quickly, that's going to limit the amount that the bank right. can, can, can cut. It, it's, mm -hmm. uh, the bank does not target the housing market, but it plays a role in, you know, what, what, you know, what the outlook for growth is and what the outlook for inflation is. And if housing really does come roaring back quickly, that's going to limit the amount that the, uh, uh, the yeah. bank of Canada can cut rates, so it's it's almost got a, a bit of a self-limiting feature to it. You know, the bank can only cut interest rates so much if uh, if housing really does come snapping back quickly. You might be the only person I can ask this to that might actually have like legitimate insight into if this happens or not. But does the Bank of Canada sit there and look at the immigration numbers and the immigration minister and all that stuff and just go, guys, what are you doing? Like, the housing market's going to go crazy if you keep pumping this many people in, or are they, I mean, I, I guess they wouldn't be happy or, or sad about it, but are they pulling their hair out going, this is not going to help housing, which is going to have to make us stay at this higher interest rate for longer? It's it's interesting. The uh, the chief economist at the banks, um, we were, so we were all on a panel early early this year in uh, in, in Toronto. There's an annual event. The Economic Club of, of Canada has, has an event. And the one topic that we just could not get away from was was immigration and, and population growth, and I, I'd, I'd never really seen it uh, before, where it was such a such a major topic, and, it, and it, it frankly is one of the big economic topics right now. And we were all on the same page, or almost all on the same page. That uh, and and look, the immigration minister himself has has admitted it. They they lost control. Mm. Um, it it you know it is just not sustainable the kind of population growth we've we've seen. I I, I don't care what happens on the supply side. You know, there, we we just cannot build to the to the kind of population growth we've seen, and we we were pulling our hair out. I don't have much hair to pull out, but uh, we were definitely pulling our, our hair out on that front because it it has made a tough inflation situation worse. The Bank of Canada is much more diplomatic in in their language. Um, they they point to some offsetting factors. You know, the the fact that we have had str such strong population growth has definitely increased the the supply of labor. It's probably been a played a bit of a role in keeping wages from rising even faster than they would have otherwise. Mm -hmm. But the way we would look at it is, is, you know, some of those issues that help dampen inflation longer term, that's over the long term. In the here and now, the pressure on on spending in the housing market hits immediately from very rapid population growth. And I, I do think it it's definitely aggravated the inflation story and definitely the housing affordability issue. And I, I actually think it was a real policy error of the last couple of years to let the population grow by more than 3% in, in a single year. Doug, I promise this will be my last mortgage renewal crisis question, okay? Um, Maybe. A lot of people believe, um, and I think to a certain extent, I, I believe this to be true also, is like, okay, well, why didn't more people default on their mortgages? The rates went up at a historical crazy amount. And if you look at, well, what all the banks were potentially doing in lenders is was, you know, they were extending the amortizations on the variable rate mortgages, pushing it out. You know, you heard the stories of 65, 80 years on an amortization based on the payment. And maybe the payment at that point is like 95 percent interest. And then when it came up to the renewals, um, they would then give the 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 homeowner an opportunity to push the renewal back. OK, you got your five years in well you can push back to 25 years. Do you believe that is probably why? things have maintained better than we thought because those options are available that maybe weren't previously available in other markets in the past? I, th I think that definitely helped. That that, that did play a role. Um, but it's interesting, you know, not not all banks treated their borrowers the same. Some mm. some did not really allow them to increase their amortization or even, 
you know, some of them made, uh, you know, basically forced them to increase their payments immediately when variable rates went up. And what those banks found is that they, they did not see that much stress in, in mm-hmm. their book. Um, I, I actually do think some of it was people did have some warning that, that rates were going to go higher. Uh, they had a fair bit of warning, not, not everyone clued in it admittingly. Um, we, we did have pretty strong income growth in, in the last couple of years. I, I mentioned the, that excess savings before. I think some of the reason why there was so much excess savings and why they're still there in Canada is that many households, you know, saw what was going on with mortgage rates. They were preparing for the day. They set aside money. And maybe the most important factor, though, is we've still had really strong job growth throughout this yeah. episode. We we have seen the unemployment rate creep up a bit, but that's partly due to the fact that, you know, we, uh, again, we've had really strong population growth and job growth hasn't just been able to keep up with all those new entrants, but people who are already in the job market really haven't lost their jobs. So they're still they're still employed. They're still seeing hopefully wage gains, and and they're just prioritizing making their 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 higher mortgage payment and maybe squeezing something else out. And and we are seeing weakness in discretionary spending in Canada. You know, if you right. talk to some of the major retailers, Canadian Tire reports on it all the time. They are seeing people having to, to dial back on their discretionary mm-hmm. spending. Uh, that now that's not everyone now you might be wondering well you know how the heck are you know then people going you know the restaurants are packed and then you know not not to bring up taylor swift again you know the 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 concerts are packed every you know the leaf games the canuck games are sold though you know people still have money spent well you know keep in mind only a roughly a third of people have mortgages um you know another third are renters and the other third uh, are, are basically mortgage free and that that last third have actually probably benefited from higher interest rates they're probably the ones in the restaurants and uh, at the leaf games uh, or at the Taylor Swift concert. So, you know, you got a really different situation among consumers, depending on which group you look at. Some have really had to pull back. Some are suffering, no question about it. Others are doing just fine. And that's why it seems, you know, in in some ways, it seems like the consumer is really doing okay. But there, there, there definitely is a lot of stress beneath the surface. Mm-hmm. It just hasn't risen to a macro level because people still have jobs. They're, they're, they're still able to just hang in there. But if rates don't start coming down, by the second half of this year, then I think we're going to see those insolvency numbers rise a lot more. And I'm sure Bank of Canada recognizes that as well as part of the the reason that they are going to bring down rates at some point. Oh, absolutely. They're they're at, they're probably one of the best analysts in in the country in in terms of gaming this out. Um, that you know they put out a financial system review every uh, every year that that really goes through all the nuts and bolts of you know how how many people are likely to face stress stress if rates stay at a certain level and they're yeah they're well aware of what uh, what, what's coming you kind of mentioned earlier uh the strength of the american consumer and uh i did a little bit of research to try and find out what i should be asking uh someone of your stature uh before you came on and i found an article that said uh you learned a lot about buying and selling (laughs) Uh, while delivering for an electronic store, can you please tell that story here? Because I want to, I want to get down to this because I do think it is just buying and selling, and you, what economics can't really account for is the people involved, and that's probably why economists <laughs> tend to get it wrong so often. Yeah, and I mean that's that's the dirty little secret in economics is it's not an exact science by by any means. You know, you like we we can't know. If, if tomorrow, first of all, if there's you know, going to be a pandemic or a war, but more fundamentally, you know, I, 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 we can't possibly predict individuals' behaviors or even business behavior with, with a high degree of accuracy. If, you know, if there's a sudden change in, in, in opinion or, you know, there's some gr- great new fad, uh, you, you, you just cannot say it with accuracy, uh, 100% accuracy, I, I should say. You know, you can look at historical trends and, you know, what how the economy has typically reacted to interest rate changes and, you know, f- uh, fiscal policy changes over time, but even then, there's always a little bit of a degree of uh, of, of uncertainty, and that's that, that that that's that's a reality. I, I you know, I don't I don't think that's uh, that that that's well known or, or appreciated, and and most economic forecasters know darn well there's there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, just in terms of that story, by the way, uh, you know, the Globe Mail approached me. I guess they they interviewed a lot of. D- D-level celebrities, um, or, or uh, you know, in terms of just one of their memorable jobs before they got in their career, and I just happened to pick that one. It was a summer job that uh, a friend of mine is his dad was manager of. It was called Crazy Kelly's in in London, um, London, Ontario, 
And uh, yeah, I was a delivery boy for uh, well a summer and, and a year through uh, through university, just delivering uh, TVs and stereos. Uh, and it, it was interesting. It was uh, it, you know taught me a lot about uh, about the economy. Um, you know, in, in you know just seeing some of the the customers coming in and, and you know how hard they would uh, try to bargain. And uh, you know, I mentioned I actually mentioned in the article that that store got all different kinds of people. Mm-hmm. You know, from the very you know the most wealthy to some of the least wealthy folks who would come in and it's interesting they wouldn't necessarily have different buying patterns mm. uh they might they might even buy this you know the same television or the the same uh, stereo system it was uh it was it was quite a lesson in, in economics i have to say by the way i think that if bank of canada does cut and you're right there's going to be some kids halloween this year as economists okay i'm not ruling it out I, you guys are not you guys are not z-list you guys are people are, are watching everything that you're saying so i just want to make sure that you guys know that we appreciate what you do out there um now i'm going to ask you a question that you may get in a cab or in an uber because i know you're not an opera singer um there are a lot of people looking at making a buying decision right now and and to be very clear to our audience, this is not financial advice. We are not mortgage brokers, okay? So to make that very clear. But there are people looking at it and going, okay, if I take the variable rate right now, you know, after prime minus whatever you're going to get, it's probably high sixes right now, give or take. And the fixed rate on the five year is in the 5.25 range. The three-year fix is a little bit lower. And then you're trying to do the math on, okay, what am I going to do here based on what I think is going to happen with Bank of Canada? And this what's going on right now where the variable is significantly higher is is to my understanding not very normal this has only happened a few times maybe in your career when you're looking at this for your own personal situation as someone that knows what you know would you bet on the variable now going down and just ride in that on the down like we wrote it on the up or would you take that more conservative i'm just going to take the fixed rate i know what my payment is i don't want to deal with this for tenant landlord or homeowner insurance policies go to squareone.ca slash the Tom Story Show. Use the link in the description. Save $20 when you start your free quote right now. So there's, and, and of course, you know, this is a question I get my entire career. Yeah. Um, there, there, are, there are two things I would, would, would point out. First of all, the financial markets are very efficient. You know, they, they have priced in what they believe is the most reasonable expectation for interest rates out there and so the, the the so-called yield curve the structure of interest rates is very efficient it's got all the information that we know mm. raced into it it is tough to outguess the market you know there there is a reason why variable rates over time um or, or variable mortgages over time have been a little bit cheaper because you are taking a little bit of a risk like you are paying a small insurance premium by locking in for that certainty and, you know, to, to reduce the, the risk of a, of a high side surprise and, you know, the, and that interest rates go up. And basically the question you have to ask yourself is, you know, does, does, does it make sense in your own personal position yeah. to pay that little bit of insurance to lock in, to get the certainty? Like you, you have to ask yourself, what kind of person are you? Like, are, are you going to be more bothered by not getting the absolute cheapest rate out there? Or are you going to be more bothered by, you know, staying awake at night, you know, fretting that rates are going to go up and you're, you know, you're going to get knocked out of your house. If the answer is the latter, then, then I actually would encourage you to lock in. You know, if you, you know, if, if you really cannot stand the, the, the stress, then it is much better to set it and forget it. And, you know, the, the, the kind of concerns that you're going to have about not getting the very best rate will be relatively minor. If instead you're a bit, you know, you, you've maybe got a little bit more financial flexibility and you can handle a little bit of a backup in rates. Generally speaking, the the variable rate, the shorter term, will will be cheaper in most circumstances. That that wouldn't have been the case two years ago. It of wouldn't course. have been a good idea yeah. uh, two years ago. That was one of those uh, relatively rare episodes where it would have been a mistake. I what what would I personally do? I would probably lock in for about a year. And I know this is kind of a mm. uh, you know a, what a lot of people were seeing doing. And then you know within within a year I'd probably switch to a, to a variable rate at, at at that point and then and then write it down. Um, I actually would personally not be that averse to just going variable uh, right, right right now and and assume it's going to come down. For a first time buyer, I would not recommend that. Yeah. Um, if you are right on the edge, if you're right up to your level of affordability, I would not recommend going uh, going going short term or, or variable. Um, I I tend to believe that. You know, most first-time buyers in in most circumstances should lock in and just yeah. pay that small bit of insurance. They know what they're dealing with. 
you know, they can get through the five years and, you know, you don't really have to worry yourself about what rates are going to do in the next few years. I've, uh, I've always been the variable rate guy. I've rode the variable rate for the last 10 years. And in eight of those 10 years, I've looked like a pretty smart person. Uh, other than the two years we've been doing this podcast, <laughs> which Steve is the fixed rate guy. So we've gone back and forth on that uh, as well. Now, a lot of people are looking at getting into the market or making a selling decision. And they're trying to look at like economic indicators for what, what they can do as a consumer to try to make the best decision. But I also fully recognize like analysis paralysis, I think is a real thing. And the people that try to know everything and everything and they think about it every single night, they're the ones that end up making the mistake or buying when they shouldn't because they've thought too much about it. And not, not that it's a bad thing, but I see that happening. For you to give advice to people in the market right now, just obviously what Bank of Canada does is a huge one, but any specific other economic indicators that a buyer or seller would be looking at to then make their next decision? And and by the way, in terms of you know the the purchasing and and selling decision, I I, I would go back to to what you said. I, I don't think you should try to overanalyze it. I'll yeah. I'll give you a personal experience. When I when I first I I bought a, my first house in uh, in in 1987 in, uh, in in Mississauga, Ontario. Within a month, we had the worst stock market crash we have ever mm. had ever. Worse than 1929, um, you know, and and uh, look, I'm I'm relatively young. I, I was an economist, but you know, what's what's on the news every night? You know, then this is within a month of me, you know, making the most important economic decision of my life. You know, you're hearing what these old timers on TV talking about, you know, the next Great Depression. Um, you know, suffice to say, we got through that. We, the, the economy actually sailed through it, no no problem at all. Um, but it was, you know. No, no one predicted that, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, all, all I can say is events can, uh, you know, no matter how much analysis you do, you, you really have to make the decision based on your own personal situation. You know, is this house right for, right for you? Is it, is it, or if you're selling, you know, is, you know, is, is this uh, from your life cycle? Is this a time to sell? I, I think trying to time the market is, is a bit of a mugs game in the, in the housing market. Um, I'm, I, I've not met anybody who can consistently call the, you know, the housing market, the real estate market with hundred percent accuracy. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe for a year or two, they think they're right. But over, over the longer term, I really wonder whether they get every, every cycle. I, I think you really have to, and certainly when you're buying, I think it comes down to, you know, can you afford it? Is it the house you want, you know, or is it the, the condo you, you want? That's, that's really what, what should be the driving determination, not whether you're, you know, you're going to get the economy and the markets and, and interest rates exactly right, uh, but to answer your question, I you know I think uh, in terms of you know is the economy really still hanging in there, or, or are we really headed for trouble? The the, the best thing to watch is uh, and and the most up to date indicator is is the labor market. Mm-hmm. You know is 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 the unemployment rate starting to really move higher? I think that yeah, personally, my my one single other than the inflation rate, my my one single favorite economic measure. Uh, that that does get a lot of attention, but I I, I think it is the the most important is the unemployment rate. Um, it, there's a lot of information buried in that, and you know the labor force survey is uh, is got its quirks and whatnot. But uh, but I think over time, you know, we got a long history on the labor market, and and it tells you pretty quickly, you know, which direction the the economy is is headed in. It you know is it improving? Is it deteriorating? Is it deteriorating rapidly? Uh, the unemployment rate tells you that almost in a nutshell. And what, by the way, what it's been telling us is things have been softening over the past uh, year, but not, not like what you would see in a traditional recession. It 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 hasn't uh, weakened that rapidly. It's just been sort of a slow, steady deterioration over the past year. So you bought that house in 1987. The stock market went down. Two years later, the market was on fire again, and then we had a 40 percent crash. Um, now there's some people that bought properties. I'm not saying this is the same thing, but bought properties in February of 2022, and their ho- their home price right now is down 20 percent, maybe in some markets, maybe more. Right? Did you sell your house after the fin- after the markets dropped? Like, did you keep the house for a long time? Because I'm just trying to figure out. Like, there's a lot of people in scarcity mindset right now because they might be actually underwater on their house, and some people are like, "I can't deal with this. I just want to get out. I'll take the loss because it's a peace of mind." But we know if we look at 40, 50 year charts in in our markets in Toronto and Vancouver and surrounding areas, we kind of see what happens with pre- with housing. It goes up and down. But typically over a period of time goes in an upwards direction. If you look at immigration, everything moving forward. So just your opinion and did you keep that house for a long time? Did you sell it when things were bad? Like what was your experience? 
So it's, it's interesting, you know, and of course I bought it fairly early in my career. Um, it's interesting. And, th- and that was a very instructive period for, for the, I always like to, to remind, you know, and I have a lot of relatively young people who work in my, my department. I, I tell them, yes, the, the real estate market really can go down, you know, and I, I lived it in the early nineties in, in Toronto, we had a full on correction. Um, you know, prices dropped by more than 25% from peak to trough in, in, in the GTA and in other parts of Ontario in the early 1990s. Um, I, I lived through it. I, I actually ended up selling in uh, about six years after I bought it and moved up uh, to another house. I, I sold it for almost the same as I bought it. I actually made a few bucks on it uh, when all was said and done. But wow, I really went through the ringer. Like, you know, right. the first couple of years, it, it you know, took, it, it had already been on, uh, on, the Toronto housing market had been on a tear at that point in any event. I felt kind of frankly rushed to get in because I thought it was going higher and it did. And then, you know, the bank can really aggressively raise rates rent. Then I don't know if you guys were around, but rates went up to 14% at, uh, at, at that point when we had five, 6% inflation. So those were hugely positive real interest rates and it crushed the housing market. Absolutely devastated it. Um, but then it, it did stabilize around the mid nineties and, uh, it took a while though. It took a long while. It really didn't start to come back in a meaningful way until the two thousands. Yeah. Uh, so basically the nineties were a lost decade for real estate in, uh, in, in Canada. And, uh, you know, I, I do like to remind people of that, that, uh, you know, we, we can go 10 years yeah. where real home prices do not rise. It's not a foregone conclusion that real estate prices are going to rise every, every decade. I, Look, over the very long sweep of history, they're a great. It's a great investment. It's uh, it's going to do well, but that doesn't mean you're going to win every decade. And when you sold, you didn't get out of the market and rent. You actually upsize in a market that wasn't go that was going down or neutral, which may have actually made a lot of sense during that period of time. Um, so it's just about getting in the market, making sure you feel good about it. Um, and if you mm-hmm. think you can time it perfectly, guess what? From 1989 to 2002, it took that long for prices to get back to average price in the city of Toronto. So that I, it, it could happen. I, I have to tell you one more story yeah. about that that second house I bought. I was working in uh, another economics department at the time and my uh, my boss, the chief economist uh, back in, uh, in, in 1993, and you know, this is after the Toronto market had been absolutely devastated. And I, I, he was, a, he was a very negative person in, in any event. And I, I mean, great economist, but he, he, all he said to me is you're buying a house now in this market. And it ended up being, I have to say, a, a like a phenomenal investment. Right. Um, you know, my, my biggest, uh, regret is, is I didn't even get more aggressive and, you know, try to go for a bigger, more expensive house at, at, at the time, because really it was the low in the, in the mid nineties. It took a while for sure. Um, but you know, that, that. That house, which I've since sold, has probably gone up like a multiple of 10 times mm-hmm. since then. Uh, we are coming near the end of our uh, conversation, but I wanted to kind of wrap with um, with a, a look behind the curtains, maybe. You meet with all of these like big bank economists. Bank of Canada, I'm sure you've been in meetings with them, or at least they're interested in your opinion, maybe even the actual federal government of Canada. What is it like? What are those meetings like? Is it just a bunch of stuffy old guys sitting around talking numbers or is there, is there a little bit of passion in there? Uh, Is it at a nice restaurant or hotel or is it at parliament? What is, what is that meeting look like? And uh, by the way, I'm not, I'm not name dropping here or anything, but it just so happens that I I went to school with Tiff Macklem. I mean, we, uh, we did our our MA together in, in Western at, uh, at, at Western. I, I actually started my career at the Bank of Canada when I was uh, right out of kindergarten. Um, my, my, my first job was actually in Ottawa at, at the Bank of Canada. So I know the organization relatively well. Not that that really, give, neither of those things, by the way, gives me any extra insight in, in terms of what interest rates are going to do. Um, but no, the, and, and first of all, it's not a bunch of guys because, you know, the finance minister, of course, is, uh, is this Christian sure. Freeland. And uh, one of the chief economists is uh, is female. My my former boss, Bank of Montreal, Sherry Cooper, was uh, was, yeah. was a female. So it's not all guys. Um, it it tends to be in in their, you know, we we do when we have our meetings with the bank canas at the bank Canada, We meet uh, with the finance department in 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 their buildings, whether it's in Toronto or, or Ottawa. I wouldn't say it's stuffy. We we know each other relatively well. It's fairly, you know, we know that uh, what we say is not going to go beyond the the walls. Of course, we treat the governor and the finance minister. With all due respect, um, 
so it's a it's a bit of a stilted meeting like we're not going to talk a hundred percent uh like like we're talking here and <laughs> we'll, mm-hmm. sure. we'll we'll talk a little a little bit more formally but people do get their opinions across and and sometimes it, it can be a little bit contentious uh as i i, I will say especially with the bank of canada um you know says so, sometimes we don't agree uh completely with what what they're what they're doing um mm-hmm. but it's we'll we'll never we'll never ask them well what are you going to do with interest rates next you know it's it, and it, frankly a lot of these discussions is they're asking us what we think Mm-hmm. And, you know, the conversations tend to be a little bit one-sided, like uh, they, they ask us questions and we give answers. And Do you think uh, they're we, listening more than 50% of the time or, or not, not listening, but um, implementing ideas from you, from you, from you guys? I'm a little bit skeptical. Okay. Uh, I, I on, honestly, and it depends on the finance minister. And, and by the way, we meet with the provincial finance ministers as well. Mm-hmm. Honestly, I think some of it, yes, they are looking for market intelligence, but I also think they're sort of looking for how can we be criticized if we do X, Y, or Z? Yeah. You know, how, how, is the, how is the private sector going to re- respond to this? And what, you know, what are they going to say? I, I actually think that's part of it. Uh, you know, part of it is that an exercise that, uh, at least from the finance minister's point of view, is they want to make sure that their budgets are based on fairly realistic assumptions. So they're sort of testing out, you know, what what we're saying about the economy, where we think it's going. And that that's, that's actually the main, you know, the number one reason, but I also think they're all, you know, they're asking us in terms of what we think of different policies, but we're just one of many, many voices that they, that they listen to. Um, I've got two final questions for you and then we won't take up any more of your time. So first one is there is a chart that is showing a lot on the internet, which shows average household income to housing prices. And the housing prices go like this and income kind of goes like this. And that's typically what people say is that this can't continue because this doesn't make sense. I just like to know your opinion on that delta and how it's gone up and why that would be the case. So the first problem with that chart is it doesn't really take interest rates on board anywhere. And of course, interest rates would be the other key mm-hmm. f- feature there. I, I like looking at, um, you know, and, and again, not to always toot the bank of Canada's horn, um, but they, they have an affordability measure that, that does take, um, in, incomes, interest rates and, uh, utility costs into effect. And, and, you know, frankly, on that measure alone, it tells you affordability is terrible. This, this is the second worst yeah. level of affordability we've had in the last 45 years. The only period worse was in the early 1980s. And if you talk to your grandparents, uh, you know, interest rates got up to 18, 19% at, at that point. So that was really extreme. Um, but, uh, to, to, to go back to your, your, your issue more, more fundamentally, um, you know, Vancouver has basically disproved that for the last, you know, 20 years that yeah. you really can get a sustained period of uh, home prices getting divorced from income. Because I think increasingly in some cities, wealth wealth is is driving the boat here. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think that, you know, that's necessarily going to translate to every city in the country. You know, that, that might not have an effect in my old hometown of London, Ontario. It, it might actually to a small degree. Um, but I, I think that's sort of the missing element there as well is that... Uh, you know, and, and it's not just wealth from Canada. You know, we're, we're seeing wealth coming from a lot of other countries that's getting parked here in Canada. And I, I'm not necessarily a big fan of that, but I think it's the reality. Mm. That's uh, one of the reasons why we are seeing uh, home prices divorce from incomes and why affordability is uh, it does, does seem so stretched. Final question is for the 33% of Canadians that are renting real estate. Um, how do we feel about rental prices moving into, I don't know, next five years? Um, is there any light at the end of the tunnel that it looks like things could calm down a little bit or, or are they going to continue to rise? I'm, I'm concerned. I'm really concerned on that front. You know, the, uh, the, the vacancy rate is, uh, across the country is exceptionally low. Um, even, even with the cap on international students, we're, we're still looking at very strong population growth over, over the next year, you know, unless there's a significant change on that front. I think the population growth is actually going to still further mm. outstrip the supply of new units over the past year. Just just some quick arithmetic. You know, the number of homes that we're completing, the, the most we've ever completed in a single year is about 250,000 a year. That That's realistically about as fast as we can create new units in this country. And I, I actually think, if anything, that's optimistic. If If we have two people per unit, let's say, conservatively speaking, that, that means we need at least 500,000, or, or, I mean, that, that can, oh, sorry, that can only accommodate 500,000 yeah, people. Yeah. So unless the population growth slows 
to 500,000 in, in a year. And, and again, it was one point over 1.2 million people in the, in the past year. Um, I, I think there's still pressure on the, on the rental market, unless we get a dramatic change in, in population growth. And I don't really see that coming. So I, I, unfortunately, I think there's still pressure on, on the rental market. Doug, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. I learned a lot. I know everyone listening learned a lot as well. Um, and you made number 100 very memorable. And, and hopefully we can awesome. ask you back one day because uh, I, re I really enjoyed this. And thank you for taking the time out of your day to do this. Oh, it's my and pleasure. Let me tell you, it's easy to tell why uh, BMO has the highest customer satisfaction rating out of the big five banks because of amazing folks like Doug. And I'm sure... Um, if you ever see Tiff Macklem on this show, it's because Doug sent him a text message and said, "Hey guys, you got you got to talk to these guys." And he'll also be, uh, well, I'm I'm sure he wouldn't do that anytime soon. But I'll see what I can do. But uh, thank you very much for the uh, thank you very much for the shout out for for being. Oh, we appreciate that. Um, yeah. But it, it it was my pleasure joining you. Thank you, you know, so I much. will say oh. I will say um, I I got some uh, some flack online because I I have put it out there publicly. I said, BMO for their customers um they are the easiest bank to work with uh when like i see them trying to get mortgages bmo is by far probably second royal bank but they're by far the best bank that are willing to do the most effort uh for their clients whether or not you like their mortgage product or not to up for debate but i'm just saying like it is it is nice to see an institution that still shows that their existing customers are as or more important than the new customers because i think there are a lot of institutions and some banks that they only look for the new business and it's refreshing for me to see um to see a, a business that really takes care of their existing clients because that's the way like tom's business and my business run right you got to look after the people that support you so i appreciate it appreciate your time well, thank today. you for, thank you very much and i will pass that on thank you awesome thank you everybody for watching thank you for listening and we'll see you next week just one sec, though.